Hello, BookTube. Micah Cummins and I decided that we wanted to do a read-along of some kind, the Buddy Read or Read-Along. Those are always lots of fun on BookTube, no matter who you do it with. And I'm already doing a book club. My Steve Tiberius Donahue book club kicks off this month with Barbara Tuckman's History, A Distant Mirror, which is a big, sprawling history of the calamitous 14th century. And that led Micah and I immediately to a choice for a read-along. We chose this. We chose Essex Dogs by Dan Jones, which is his fiction debut. He's a popular historian with a lot of books to his credit. And he decided to write a, a fiction, historical fiction trilogy set in the Hundred Years' War. So it seemed like an absolutely natural choice. Uh, we went with this and we announced it. We'll break the book into three parts and then we'll have some sort of, hopefully we'll have some sort of discussion in the last week of February. And it was only belatedly that we realized that Essex Dog uh, is not out in America yet. It doesn't come out in the U.S. until Valentine's Day. It's In BookTube, it's kind of easy to forget that because the U.K. BookTube channels have had this for months and a lot of them have talked about it. Uh, so we thought we'd push ahead anyway rather than cancel this, this plan and pick a new book. And we'll just be extra careful about spoilers until we can be reasonably sure that most of you have access to the book. Although, I would think that except for that live discussion at the end of the month, we don't need to deal with spoilers anyway, if we're talking about this. Uh, but that was, that's what I'm gonna, I want to talk about today. Mike has already put up uh, his first video on the subject, and I'll leave a link to it below. And we'll just set the stage for this first part of the book, which is what the book does give you a sense of what it's like. The, the, the action opens in the summer of 1346 when King Edward III and his warrior son and the uh, host of, of English forces are making their way across the channel to Normandy, to the beaches of Normandy for a wave of invasion. And it's pretty obvious to everyone involved that the French are going to be waiting. French forces and especially French archers are going to be waiting. This landing is not going to be unopposed. And our action centers around the titular Essex Dogs, which is a group of English fighting men, about 10 English fighting men. Uh, there's a, a big, stolid, man of few words, completely physically dependable character named Millstone. There's a defrocked priest that everyone calls Father, who is gradually being, we're told, rotted away by anger and alcohol to the point where he will reach a point where he doesn't distinguish between friend and foe. In other words, he's becoming more and more of a danger to his own companions. There's Scotsman and Pissmeyer, and there are a, a couple of new Welshmen who are archers. There are three archers that are better known to the Essex dogs. There's, there's Tebby, there's Thorpe, and there's Romford, a blonde-haired young boy named Romford, who is the youngest of the Essex dogs. And uh, he's only 16, and seems pretty quickly to have a secret or two of his own, which is not unexpected in a, a chemistry like this. Leading the Essex Dogs is a 43-year-old man named Loveday Fitztalbot, who has seen, he has been part of this informal grouping of the Essex Dogs for a while. He has seen uh, Essex Dog members die, and he remembers them. And they fill the ranks, and they they have each other's backs, and they are seasoned warriors. And they are under the employ in this particular, as this novel starts, they're under the employ of a minor nobleman named Sir Robert Lestrange, who we're told is a fool. He's a fool, but he recruited them for this job, and he intends to pay them for 40 days of service. But there's no... There's no uh, kind of chivalric feudal loyalty that moves upward in the chain. They, they don't like him. He, and he's not a worthwhile person. He's a, a, a blithe, pompous idiot. Uh, and he's leading them just as, you know, because you got to have a boss and the boss is leading you into fire and maybe he'll take less, less risk, fewer risks than you do. He'll be in less danger than you will be. But he's paying you, so you're a grunt, and you'll do what you're told. And even that description alone will give you a pretty clear sense of what Jones is going for in this book. He is not writing elevated historical fiction. To put it mildly, if you've seen even one military movie, 
or TV show, you have seen this formula. A hard-bitten group of grunts who know the real face of war and are loyal to each other, even though the pressures, the psychological pressures of war are getting to some of them, and may force a conflict of loyalties down the line, where the enemy isn't so much the French as it is the establishment. It, the French are nameless, faceless figures for the most part. They are opposition to be met on the battlefield and either cut down or they cut you down. But if there's an enemy here, it's Sir Robert. And by extension, the barons and the lords and the princes and even the king up above him. It's the By extension, it's the, the blithe and clueless general blimps that sent so many young people to the meat grinders of World War I. And whether or not you believe that, and whether or not you're on board with that as a gimmick, will largely determine whether or not you get along with this book in the first part that we're reading for this week. The characters aren't anything out of the ordinary at all. You have seen these characters. If you read military fiction, if you watch military theater, you've seen these characters a million times before. And Dan Jones knows that. He's young. But he's not, a, he's not an idiot. He knows that. He, he's seen his share of these dramas himself. He's certainly read his share of them. My God, that could not be any clearer from the opening chapters of this book. He knows what he's doing. He's creating a very simple Band of Brothers type story. If you have read, for instance, what I consider to be a gigantic influence on this book, Bernard Cornwell's Saxon books about Uhtred and his men, then you know what you're getting into here. You're not going to be facing much in the way of complexity or subverting expectations. <laughs> you will face action right from the beginning. Action happens on page two, and it just keeps going. These are soldiers in enemy country, so there's never a given of safety or security. There is never a moment when you're sure, okay, this next chapter will be peaceful. There's never anything like that. And you know that you're going to encounter barbarities. And again, if you know the template here, you know that our heroes, Loveday, Fitztalbot, all the way down the line, are going to commit atrocities. They're not just going to have atrocities committed on them. This is supposed to be the grim and gritty face of the grunts level of war. And I'm sure that in Dan Jones's mind, somewhere along the line, he is meaning to imply that that experience at that level never really changes. That the only thing that really changes is the ordinance but not the attitudes or the men or the leadership or lack thereof or the suddenness of danger or the depravities that it drives you to or the brutalities of war, which we get in very unadorned prose in this book. This book has no adorned prose. There is no beautiful prose in here. This is, this is meant to, to tell a story. It's not meant to be anything more than that. There are books that do, right? Probably in America, the quintessential example of a book like this that is shot through from beginning to end with beautiful prose would be the Red Badge of Courage. This is not that. <laughs> it's, it's that in, in the grunts level view. And it's also that in the, in the key moment in the Red Badge of Courage is that the main character undergoes a terrifying trauma, a change of heart. You're going to get plenty of that here, but you're going to get plenty of the just the random face of war's brutality. One, one passage as the the forces are landing, they're facing violent opposition from the French. One passage runs that one lad, no more than 15 summers on him, had his leg shattered. He collapses, screeching. White blades of bone poke through his pink flesh. Very vivid stuff like that, and trust me, that just gets more intense as the book goes on. Uh, up until the, the climactic scene at the end of the book, which is in addition to everything else about it, in addition to its cinematic attitude, it's drenched in gore. Uh, this is a very cinematic book. This is begging to be made into a screenplay of some kind or another. It's begging to be televised in some way or other, either in, on a streaming cable service, which would do it the best justice, or into some sort of movie. Uh, and a reader of history will know already the, the rough outline of... Uh, what is going to happen in this story. We'll get to the overall story of this novel the, once we've gotten further along out of spoiler territory and into the book. But uh, there are a few things that you'll notice right away when you start. One, uh, one of the things I, is what I've already mentioned to you here, which is that this is brutal prose. 
this is not this is not drawing any kind of uh, you know Thomas Mallory courteous veil over the violence that we're seeing. There's plenty of that. Another thing that you'll notice, it'd be hard to avoid, uh, is anachronism which is a choice that you have to make as a historical novelist. You have to decide, once you've done your research, you have to decide, well, okay, human nature stays the same from one millennia to another, but people can seem very different from one century to another. You would know this for sure. The more you learn about, for instance, your great-grandparents' world, the stranger they will seem to you. The, the more you know about how they went through their day, the stranger it will seem to you. And that's an eye blink of time. This is centuries ago, a thousand years ago. So it it stands to reason that if you're not employing anachronism, then Loveday and his men will seem very strange to you, and they don't. Some historical novelists make sure to keep the past strange. They view that as the, uh, uh, the biggest challenge to their storytelling, and they take that challenge on it consciously. Other historical novelists, far more of them, uh, decide to employ some degree of anachronism or another, and that is definitely true here. Fitzroy and Fitztalbot and his men are not just band of brothers like in the 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 HBO World War II series. They're not just like that in terms of the ground they're trying to cover. They're they're essentially those men. They uh, have dropped f bombs every single sentence. They are they are incredibly foul mouthed. They don't seem to know or care much about the the conflict that they're involved in, and a whole bunch of other things too that will jump out at you right away. Those of you who know the period, it will jump out at you right away. In in an early early scene, so no spoilers here at all. It's right at the beginning of the book, and it's it's incidental, except to the point I'm making. At one point, we learn early on in the book that Loveday Fitztalbot likes to carve makes little carvings to pass the time. And he makes them of figures that he knows about from, you know, literature or history or whatever. And early on in the book, he's making one of those carvings, and uh, uh, Romford asks him, who is it? And he says, it's St. Margaret, or 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 something like that, uh, St. Martha, something like that. He, may, he names a character from the New Testament. And then says that he has no idea... I think she did something for Jesus. I don't, I don't really know. That wouldn't be true. That's a 21st century attitude, definitely. A 21st century character who's carving St. Saint, uh, Saint Martha would not know and would say exactly that. But it, it, a character in 1346 would not. And that continues all throughout. And that's a conscious decision. Dan Jones knows that. He, If he makes Loveday Fitztalbot and the rest of the Essex dogs faithful to what they these men would be like in 1346 the things that would be in their mind the mental furniture that they have the things they talk about and the way they talk about it if he made them completely faithful to history they would be alien to his readers that is the decision that historical novelists face all the time about anachronism uh, okay well i can i can do honor to all of my mountains of research by making these characters exactly what they are in the records or I cannot. Or I can make them something out of a Schwarzenegger military action buddy movie because that will be more recognizable to my readers. That's the decision that Dan Jones has made. He's made the latter decision. So you just have to be, you have to make your peace with that when it comes to reading this book. The broader historical strokes, the characters, the broader historical characters, the ground covered, the methods involved, those are all picture perfect accurate. It's the people who aren't. And that's just a, it's a decision that he's made and it carries on throughout the book so if that's going to bother you if you're reading love day Fitztalbot and his men and you're listening to them talk and in every crudity and every obscenity and every f-bomb and every threat and every offhand muttered comment they sound exactly like grunts in a world war ii movie if that's going to bother you you should know about that ahead of time because that's what you're getting here i admit dan jones lays it on so thick that it bothered me at quite a few periods. At quite a few periods, I was wishing that the Essex dogs weren't quite so recognizable. <laughs> but but I was swept away in this first part. I was swept away by the action. Dan Jones's histories are pretty good. And here we see that in addition to those histories, 
He's read a lot of historical fiction, I would guess. He's read a lot of historical fiction. I could probably, aside from Bernard Cornwell, I could probably pinpoint a few of the things that he's read. And they wouldn't all be medieval historical fiction. Uh, I might be wrong about that. Maybe he's never read any, but he has a sure grasp of what he's doing. For, for fiction, not history. Drastically different toolkits. Not everyone who tries to make this jump is successful at it. I, Essex Dogs is, in that sense, narratively speaking, an unquestionable success, <laughs> just unquestionably. You won't want to stop reading. So that I'm going to wrap that up. That is the first part of what we're doing. We are following a band of uh, hired warriors under the command of a nobleman on the ground in France, working their way inward. Now, the Hundred Years' War didn't have much of a grand strategy. It was move from village to village, burn everything that goes that that stands pillage everything that moves and kill everyone who's alive in your path you kind of know that going in there there's not going to be this is not a quest for a grail so to an extent dan jones is going to have to impose a plot in on this book it can't be just that it can't be just a narrative fictional chronicle of of uh, the hundred years war that it can't be that or that won't work and he does try to impose a plot, a couple of them. And we'll be getting to those as they unfold uh, next week and the week after that. So I hope you'll join us. I, I don't know that you can quite now. You'll probably have this on hold at your library. Uh, or a lot of you, a lot of you who are who heard our announcement video for this told me that you, you broke down and just bought a copy from the UK. That's never been any easier to do. It's easy to buy a UK edition book now. Uh, so some of you will be, will be reading this already. A great number of you will probably wait until you have access to it in the US market. That's fine. We'll stick we'll stay clear of spoilers as we as we discuss part two next week. But that that is our introduction to Essex Dogs. The good and the bad of it. So I'll I'll wrap this up for now and we'll come back next week. Thank you, Book Two.